one, check one. Ready? Okay, let's try this again. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, y'all with me? 
Welcome to our kindred spirits today. Um, it is in celebration and recognition of Women's Week. Before we get started with the presentation, though, I have a, a few announcements, or one announcement, really. Um, I'd like everyone to um, say hello to Jan Owen over here. She is with the Women's March, and if you're interested, um, please go see Jane, uh, Jan, sorry, after the presentation if you're interested in giving a signature for reproductive freedom in the, in the state of Colorado, okay? Um, hello to all of our viewers online, and I would like to welcome Dr. Stephanie Hillwig, who will be presenting um, Women's Week, Challenges for Women at Work. But before we hear from Dr. Hillwig, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Leibig, who is a co-chair of Women of Higher Ed. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Dr. Schneider. It's Dr. Liebig, by the way. Okay, so today we already had our bandana project taking place. I guess that was a great success, and now we have kindred spirits. But for the rest of this week, we have a lot of stuff themed around the concept of I'm sorry, comma, not sorry, um, looking at the way in which women and other marginalized groups have to um, continue to apologize for their identities, their bodies, their existences, whatever it is. And so MAGE, our male advocacy for gender equity group, will be presenting I'm Sorry, What's Next in the sub tomorrow from 11 to 1. I invite you to go hang out. There's going to be an interactive um, <clears throat> little activity there. And then we'll be painting the rock. Hopefully the weather's good enough. Um, and that's going to be 2 to 4 between housing and the sub. And that's also in celebration of the... Um, Farmers Awareness Week as well, National Farmers Awareness Week. And then Wednesday at 6 to 8 in Richardson Hall, there is Cycles and Sundays. This is when you um, can submit anonymous questions regarding menstruation, and there's going to be a panel of experts who are going to answer those questions. And then on Thursday, there's the big event, A Walk a Mile in Her Shoe, that will take in her shoes that will take place at 1 p.m. on the green. You can uh, use this QR code, and plus there's um, on this week at Adams, there's also a little sign in there where you can submit um, any club, group, department, whatever you want to be able to compete in that competition and discuss women's issues. And then uh, I'm challenging everyone to a poetry challenge that's going to take place in the core at 6 p.m. on Thursday around the theme of I'm sorry, comma, not sorry. And then on Friday, we have a sign-making party for the Women's March that's going to take place on Saturday. So on Friday from 5 to 7 in the sub, come get some material, make a sign, and then show up at the march the next day at, 8 a, uh, sorry, at 10 a.m. right in front of the art building. We're going to walk downtown and then come back. And we will be marching once again for all of the issues that we continue to march for. So please join us all for those events. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Um, so again, I'm Dr. Stephanie Hillwig. I teach in the sociology department. Um, and uh, I have um, a presentation today, sort of discussion on challenges women face in the workplace. So um, I don't know if all of you guys can see it, but I'll talk about it. But I'm gonna kind of center what I'm talking about on a book. Um, a specific book called What Works for Women at Work. Um, it was by two um, female researchers, Joan Williams, Rachel Dempsey. They interviewed over 100 women, about 127 women. 56% of those women were women of color. Um, and they just asked them, like, what are the big difficulties you're facing at work? And tell us your story. And so these were really in-depth interviews. And they were able to piece together a lot of these interviews and they identified really four major challenges that women were facing um, in the workplace. What was interesting is of the 127 women, all of but five of them uh, experienced at least one of these challenges in the workplace. So of 127, only five women said, no, I've never had that problem or any of these problems and all five of those women owned their own business. <laughs> so they ran their own business. Um, so the only five women, all of the women of color, um, experienced at least one of the challenges we're going to be talking about. 
But one of the things I kind of want to preface before we go into this is we're coming off of a decade where the book Lean In was written. And the book Lean In kind of gave us this argument that, well, we're kind of our own problem. Women, if we just leaned in more, right? If we just tried a little harder, if we just put in a little bit more effort, then all of these difficulties we face um, in the workplace would just go away. It really kind of the onus was on us to fix the problems. Um, and it turns out that a lot of research done in the last decade, it's not that simple. We can't just lean in more um, and expect you know, miraculous results in the workplace. We also have to, you know, think about the fact that there are challenges unique to women that, that women face in the workplace, but there's often this unspoken rule that we're not supposed to talk about any of these problems. If we talk about any of these problems, then we're whiners, or we're making a big ruckus, or we're causing problems. Um, and so there's a lot of social pressure for women to just keep to yourself, don't whine about the issues that you're experiencing, buck up, lean in, and just deal with it um, and cope with them. But you know, the truth is we have to talk about these issues, we have to put them out there um, and really address them. Um, so the four challenges, and I'll just kind of introduce them um, very quickly, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail um, on each of them. The first they called Prove It Again. Uh, the second they called The Maternal Wall. You can guess what that one is probably about. The third is The Tight Rope. Uh, and the fourth is The Tug of War. Uh, and so we'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. But one of the things to be aware of is even if w women experience just a few of these over the course of their career, just a few of these issues, and only a few times, we have to remember that all of these challenges, they accumulate against a woman's career. So it might seem, a lot of people, like a woman might say one example, right? One situation that they have experienced. And a lot of people go, well, that's just one situation, right? That's just one experience. That's not a systemic problem. That's just one incident that happened to one person. But we have to remember that's one incident among many that accumulate over a 40-year career. That is one incident that happened to millions of women across the country that accumulates across all of their careers, and all of these in combination really do impact the promotion ability that women get at work, their raises at work, what they're able to accomplish at work. Um, and one of the other issues is because women are expected to take on these problems themselves, like this is your problem, you're supposed to fix it, that it leads to women sort of adopting low self-esteem at work. They think, okay, well, this is my problem. Like, if I were just better at it, right, if I just leaned in more, I wouldn't have to deal with these problems. If I was just the right kind of woman at work, then I wouldn't have to deal with these problems. Um, and so we need to remember that these problems really are systemic. Remember, they interviewed 127, and the only women who weren't experiencing any of these issues essentially were their own boss, and they ran their own company um, at their own place. All right, so let's talk about briefly um, what each of these um, are. The first one, prove it again. What it really comes down to is how men and women are judged when they're new on a job and they're on the job. And really what it comes down to is men are judged for their potential, right? Um, if you're working on a big project, it's like, oh, I really think they could get it done. Men are judged on their potential. Women are judged on their performance, right? So they have to prove that they are capable of performing um, uh, well at a particular um, position. Uh, and 
even if women perform well at a particular task, right? It's like, okay, well, we, we need to see that you're going to be able to handle this level of responsibility. So women are given this level of responsibility. And let's say they do well. It's sort of like, okay, well, we need to make sure that you're really up for the task of taking it on. It's like, we need to see you prove it again, right? We need to see. And so women find themselves constantly at work having to prove themselves over and over and over and over again. Their past successes don't mean as much for their future um, as it does for men. And so women are constantly finding themselves, they have to, to prove it. So it can play out in a myriad of different ways. One way that it can play out is a woman could be at a job for a long period of time and have a lot of experience, a lot of um, uh, uh, time on the job, and her seniority on the job is ignored for younger men coming in. Uh, so it could be her seniority is ignored um, and her experience at work um, is ignored. Uh, and so women find themselves, and women said a lot of the times, I mean, there's several things, an article described it as uh, walking um, backwards in high heels is how women have to do the job, that women essentially, the standard for what is an accomplishment is higher for women than it is for men. So men have to achieve this in order to get praise and accolades and the promotion and the rewards. Women have to achieve this level in order to get that same level of recognition. So women find themselves having to work harder to get the same level of recognition uh, at work. Uh, in several recent studies, one of um, the patterns that they tended to find, which was interesting, and this is a separate study from this one, is they found that when men were successful at work, like they had a successful project, they were given credit. It's like, ah, you are good at that job. When women were successful, it's like um, it was accountable to luck. It's like, okay, well, that was an easy project, or anyone could have done well on that project, and vice versa. If there was a mistake or a challenge at work, women's mistakes and challenges were attributable to their core ability at work. For men, it was like, oh, well, that was a tough situation, right? Anybody would have messed up there under those circumstances. Um, so this can accumulate um, over many, many years um, on the job. And women find themselves, even at their final stages of their career, having to prove themselves at work uh, that they're capable of handling projects. This one... Um, the maternal wall. Uh, they also refer to it in, in other pieces of literature as the baby penalty. Uh, but this one is really interesting. I don't know if a lot of you guys know, we talk about the income gap all the time, right? You guys are familiar with the income gap, and I think you guys know the income gap is like, I think overall about 81 cents on the dollar, right? Well, it depends on who the woman is on what that income gap is. I don't know if a lot of you guys know, but for single women without children and single men without children, the pay gap is only about 92 cents on the dollar. It's not as large. But if you look at women who have children to men who have children, the pay gap is 68 cents on the dollar. Almost all of the pay gap between men and women comes from mothers getting paid less. This is the maternal wall. So the maternal wall is essentially the challenges women face. I mean, let's face it, we live in a country of the Protestant work ethic. Those who spend the most hours at work wins, right? And I don't know what you win, but you win everything at work. Um, it's this Protestant work ethic. And so women who are mothers often have to split their time with their families, with their children. Uh, and this can make challenges, particularly jobs that are more competitive, particularly jobs that really want their employees to be around and visible in evenings um, and on weekends and um, other time periods that don't make it as easy for women to participate in a lot of these um, activities. So women often say as mothers that it's often one of their biggest barriers in the work. I can explain this by telling a story. This is a true story. So after I gave birth to my youngest child, Charlie, um, she was 
a few weeks old, and I don't know if you guys know at the time, but at the time, Adams State University did not have maternity leave. So she was born February 26, 16 years ago. She just turned 16. I did not have maternity leave. I was an untenured professor. And uh, so my boss, in fact, when I told my boss I was pregnant, his exact words were to me were, well, figure out what you're going to do with your classes and let me know. It's exactly what he said to me. So I struggled to figure out what to do with my classes. I took one week off, had a cesarean section, but took one week off, and then I was back in the classroom after that one week. Uh, and I just put her in a sling, went to class and taught. My husband at the time, uh, he taught in the history department, so we would just trade off the baby. <laughs> we would trade off. He would have him in his office while I was teaching, and I would um, have her in my office when I was teaching. Uh, one time I was teaching class, and I was nursing, and I could hear uh, Charlie in his office, um, and she started crying. If anything knows about nursing mothers, I'm immediately like, I hear my baby crying. <laughs> so I had to cancel class right then and there and let them go uh, so I could go over and nurse her. So then a couple weeks after that, my husband goes on uh, an overseas trip to Norway, uh, and he's gone for a few weeks. She's one month old. I'm back at work. I have a one-year-old and I have a newborn, and I'm back at work full time. And after work one day, I'm at work, I'm, I'm with her in my classes the whole day by myself because he's not around to take her for that class. And I finish my last class, I'm exhausted, I go home, I'm sitting on my couch, I'm nursing my daughter who's a month old, uh, and my son's running around and I get a call from work. I'd apparently missed a department meeting. And so my boss tells me, the same one who said, let me know what you're going to do with your classes and let me know, said, you missed a meeting. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I've, it's hard for me to keep, you know, everything straight, right? And my punishment was that I had to take minutes at all the meetings for the rest of the academic year. So that was my punishment, um, having a baby one month old um, after she was born. And, you know, and I'm here to tell you, you know, we talk about infants, but it, it doesn't end there. You know, I just spent a week in the hospital with my daughter um, from complications from her surgery when she was very little. And so there's a lot of times parents, and particularly mom, moms, they want to be there with their kid. When they did interviews and they looked at women who had quit working as a result of staying home with their children, the idea is that a lot of these women made that decision easily. They wanted to be stay-at-home moms. And interviews with most women who were stay-at-home moms found most of them did not make that decision lightly, and it wasn't the decision that they wanted to make. They thought about it. They deliberated long enough. And most of them tried to make it work with their jobs. They tried to make more flexible schedules. They tried to deal with their job while being a mother, but their their job just wouldn't allow them to be flexible. These were women who were not opting out of the workplace. These were women who were being pushed out of the workplace um, as a result of having children. Uh, then we have the tightrope. This one's really interesting. Men, you probably, this probably never occurred to you, but for women, we constantly have to think about how we present ourselves, particularly if we're in a professional setting. We, it's, it is a political decision on every single physical attribute um, of our bodies, from what we wear to the makeup we put on to how long we wear um, our, our hair. So the tightrope is essentially women are trying to balance, right? They're walking, I want to think of the balance beam, I'm a forward gymnast. Um, the balance beam, the tightrope that we're constantly trying to balance this idea that we need to come into work, right? Generally, workplaces that have been centered around men, right? So there's this aggressiveness. There's leaning into what it's like to be at work in a more masculine environment. But we're also expected to be feminine, right? We're also expected to be women. So women are constantly questioning everything that they do. Am I wearing enough makeup? 
Am I wearing too much makeup? Is my clothes appropriate? Is it too feminine? Is it too masculine? Should I wear my hair long? Should I wear it down? Should I wear, cut my hair short? Um, these are questions that women are constantly deliberating, and they are a political decision. Guys, you probably wake up in the morning, you throw clothes on. You don't think about what image you are setting off to the world, do you? You don't, you don't worry about the kind of man that people are going to think that you are. But for women, we have to constantly think about the kind of women that we present um, in the workplace. This even impacts the way we talk at work. There's a lot of research being done that women have to use what is referred to, I've, I've seen it referred to as women speak, and I've heard it referred to as tentative language. Women have to talk at work very differently than men do. And it sounds something like this, if they want to start a project. So, like, I was thinking, uh, you, if you have a different opinion, just, just let me know. But, you know, I was thinking, do you think if we did this, that might work? Something along those lines. It's almost like we have to ask permission to have an idea every single day uh, at work. And so women have to use this ten of a language. We have to constantly acknowledge other people. Now what's interesting is they've even found that if women are negotiating for raises, using tentative language is far more likely to get them a raise than if they ask for raises the same way men do. So there's this idea that we can go to work and we can talk the way men talk at work, and all the research has shown that it's just, it's just not true. We, we can't talk. Um, we're viewed as abrasive if we do. We're viewed as bitchy, pardon my French, if we do. Um, that we have to use this kind um, of language about how we talk to other people in the workplace. Personally, I've seen a lot of research that says that tentative language is actually not bad. It's really just acknowledging other people's feelings. And so I read one research article that said, we shouldn't be teaching women how not to use tentative language. We should be teaching men how to use tentative language because it's just acknowledging other people's um, uh, the way they, um, their feelings, right? And their approaches and their opinions um, when we're engaging in this. And then there is the last one, the, the tug of war. The tug of war is probably one of the most challenging ones to talk about. When I read the book, they definitely said it was the one that was the most difficult to essentially discuss in part because it deals with how women get along with other women in the workplace. But most, 56% of the women, in fact, it was the most reported issue of women reporting as a challenge that they have uh, in the workplace. And what it really comes down to is some women respond to the challenges that women face in the workplace by targeting other women in the workplace. Um, and in order to improve their own relative position um, at work. So essentially what happens, and I, I, I honestly truly believe this, that most women don't engage in the tug of war. And it's more likely to happen in work environments that are more competitive and work environments where there's fewer women. In environments where there's fewer women, what happens is you get this tug of war between women who are trying to get that praise, trying to get that um, recognition, and some women who want to get those promotions, they want to get that success, they see that coming off of the backs of other women. It can include um, all sorts of things from discussing other female colleagues negatively to their bosses behind their back, um, undermining their efforts on projects, uh, excluding them from projects, uh, dismissing their experience at the workplace, sabotaging their work, uh, insulting them in front of others. So some of the terms that are used to describe this are indirect aggression, relational aggression. It's really just sort of the accumulation of microaggressions of what some women saying um, essentially, if I'm going to succeed as a woman at work, I need to demonstrate to everybody that I can go above and beyond the other women at my workplace. 
And so in order to appear that you're going above and beyond the other women at your workplace, you try to give everyone the impression, right, that the other women at your workplace um, aren't as successful as you are. So you hinder their success uh, in multiple ways. So it's essentially improving one's own status off of the status of other women um, in the workplace. And you know, the solution here is we have to kind of acknowledge that this is often a situation created by a workplace environment. Whenever a workplace environment is more competitive and people feel like they need to earn accolades, they need to earn recognition, you don't just get it as a result of being an employee, then essentially you're increasing competition. And when you increase competition, you're increasing that risk that women feel that they need to essentially step all over each other in order to try to vie for the top. And we don't want that, right? We want an environment where women are working with each other rather than trying to step over one another, uh, trying to vie for the top. So this just sort of brings up to the last. I know I kept this nice and short because you guys are all eating lunch. Um, but, uh, you know, it really sort of comes down to what are the solutions, right? And, you know, up until now, I think it's always been a solution. Women just need to fix themselves. They need to stop using tentative language or they need to, I don't know, stop having kids. Uh, I don't know what they need to do about that, you know. Um, but they need to lean in, right? They need to address all of these issues. But we have to remember that a lot of these problems are systemic and workplaces can do better at reducing some of these challenges that women in, um, face in the workplace. Um, so we need to look at a workplace and we need to look at leadership positions and ask ourselves, well, are those leadership positions amenable to women with children? Or are those only positions, if we look at leader positions on campus, do we see people with children? in those leadership positions, or is it just the women who don't have children who are making it into those leadership uh, positions? Um, we need to have a clear way that workplace bullying or workplace aggression can be addressed in a fair um, and open way. And how workplaces can create that competitiveness that exacerbates that, that makes that worse. And so how can workplaces decrease the level of competitiveness so people don't feel like they have to step over each other in order to um, be recognized in the workplace? All of us just want to go to work and be recognized, don't we? And we want to recognize for the contributions we make and for the work uh, that we do. But most importantly, we need to pay attention. If we see women are leaving their jobs, or if we see women stepping down from leadership roles, we need to start asking, why is that happening? Are there something going on that can be done to um, address that these challenges that, um, that women are facing? So I know I kept it nice and short and simple. Um, and does anyone have any questions? All right, I'll let you guys just kind of finish eating and talk amongst yourselves. <laughs>